Okay, we've been uh, I've been trying to get done with this invisible nation, but the Holy Spirit has said, "Hey, uh, this has to go on." And I'm addressing different issues within it, but it really does all come under this, the umbrella of this understanding that we that our citizenship is not of this world, precious bride of Christ. Our citizenship does not belong to any nation, empire, or such in under this world system in this age of the Gentiles, in this wicked age that Jesus said he would be with us until the end of. Okay, our citizenship is in the new Jerusalem. Even this obsession with Jerusalem, people, please understand. And I, and I made it clear, I think a couple shows ago, I explained to you that, yes, Jerusalem is important to the Lord. And Israel, its initial and original boundaries that God set for it under the Abrahamic covenant with Abraham is important to God. And God has a Palestinian covenant with Abraham. And he will keep it. Okay, so that land is important, yes. And that's why you see this spiritual and natural conflict around its boundaries all the time. Because, yes, God is involved in that. But people, believers in Christ, we are not even looking to this Jerusalem. Okay? We are looking to the new Jerusalem. We are citizens of the new Jerusalem, whose builder and maker is God, who is the mother of us all and is in the heavens. And God, even after Christ's millennial reign, God the Father will bring down this new Jerusalem upon a new heavens and a new earth, and he will make his abode amongst us in a new heavens and a new earth, in the new Jerusalem, which he is preparing for us. If you want to see the glory of that, just go to Revelation right before you go to bed. This will give you, instead of nightmares, instead of going on the Internet or watching some Nephilim horror series on cable tonight before you go to sleep, Go to the book of Revelation and read the last two chapters, 21 and 22, and read all about the, the beauty and the glory of the new Jerusalem, which will be our eternal inheritance. That's who we are citizens of. That's the nation. That's the great urban center, the city, the free market system, enterprise, whatever word you want to use, that we belong to eternally as true blood-bought, spirit-filled, and indwelt believers in, uh, of Christ in his mystical body as his bride. Okay? Now, I want to get into some things today to give us a perspective of why it's so futile to continue, even on a natural basis, to strive over the... Um, how can I say it? The survival or to curtail the extinction of these nation states, of which um, the United States of America is one. Uh, we claim, all of us that are out here, I, I, I would say without exception, maybe there might be somebody I don't know about, but pretty much anyone who's out here on blog talk radio or that's preaching end times, agrees that we are in the very end times. Okay? I have nailed it down to, I believe that we are in the birth pangs of the intolerable anguish, uh, the, the um, beginning of sorrows, as Jesus put it in, in his uh, lecture on this in the scripture. Uh, not the very end, but the beginning of the end. Many others believe that we're already further along. Whatever your stand may be, if we believe this, then we have to understand the political climate, the geopolitical climate and structure which will um, define the system, the world system of the last days. And I hate to break it to you patriots out there, whatever country you're from, it is not that of the prominence of nation-states. 
Nation states is an era or an epoch of history that has seen its day, that it's gone by, just as other epochs have gone by. Okay, if, and we're going to look at Daniel and Revelation, just a few verses here. But, you know, when, when Daniel was on the earth and he was uh, confronted with Nebuchadnezzar's dream, God had given Nebuchadnezzar a dream of kingdoms, of empires, of which his at that time was in power. And he was very uh, anxious over the longevity of his kingdom. Would his kingdom endure forever? Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian ruler, wanted to know that. So God gave him a dream and gave his servant Daniel the Hebrew, the prophet, the interpretation to that dream. And in that dream, God, Daniel, through God's inspiration, through the Holy Spirit's inspiration, explained to Nebuchadnezzar a, excuse me, a succession of empires. Named his as one empire. Was still, it was it represented in an image. And the image was made of certain substances in the form of a man like himself. And he was the head of gold, representing Babylonia, Babylon. Okay? And then underneath that were the Medes and the Persians. And then underneath that was Alexander the Great's kingdom under Greece. And then, finally, was Rome, the fourth empire. And then an extension or a, a, a revision of that or a resurrection of that final empire was represented in the ten toes at the bottom of the image. And there was something that was very interesting about that, and, and that was this, that the it was a mixture. Up until that point, all the alloy, all the the uh, substances were, were solid substances, gold, silver, brass, okay, iron representing Rome, the iron kingdom. But when it came down to the toes, it was iron mixed with clay. Now, there are many things that we bring into that, and who are the aliens? I also apply that to the interbreeding between uh, celestial beings and human beings and, and the mixture of hybrids and so. But we're not going there tonight. We're going to stay on a natural level. Okay, but the iron being in the toes shows that it comes from the initial root, the original root of this last kingdom, the Roman system, but it's mixed together with another substance that does not adhere, that falls off, that cannot hold securely to the iron and make it one solid substance, and that is clay. And that's what we see here. We see that in the very last days, the final kingdom, which we're told in Daniel and Revelation, will be made up representing representative of ten kings or ten kingdoms or monarchs under one uh, tyrannous ruler. We refer to that as the Antichrist, okay, or the, the beast of Revelation. They give their will to the beast, and he rules for three and a half years in absolute tyranny, okay? But it's ten kingdoms, but notice the nature of those kingdoms, iron and clay. That means that it has a semblance of the original Roman Empire, but it doesn't have the stability, the unity, the solidity of the substance of the initial Roman Empire. It's weak because it's, it's mixed with this other substance. And this is what I believe represents nationalism, democracy, publicanism, uh, communism, capitalism, socialism, uh, Islam. All these different things are clay that cannot adhere to that initial strong substance of iron that ruled the, the Roman Empire at the beginning. And there have been several forms of government and societal structure that have evolved or devolved, however you want to look at it. I look at it more as devolved. I don't say evolved because I don't see human history uh, producing more and more success in going toward a, a successful future, an end. I see it devolving. 
It's degenerating. Just as God showed in that initial prophetic message of the image, uh, it went from the most valuable and solid and pure substance, gold, to less and less valuable uh, substances. It went from gold to silver to brass to iron to eventually clay, which is worthless and soft and breaks up and, and has no no strength in it. So it's a degeneration, a devolving, not an evolving. See, this is where Satan has man deceived again into believing that he's evolving, that he's increasing, that he's going forward, that he's rising higher. But God, as always, sees things completely opposite as man, truthfully. Man is deceived, listening to Satan. God knows the truth. He says, no, you're not evolving, you're devolving. Which, with each successive kingdom or empire or form of law or rule or governing, you are descending in character, in value, in worth, in substance, in very substance. Okay, so there's been a history of devolution of these kingdoms. Okay, I mean, if we just take it from the time of Christ, we had the Roman Empire reigning. Okay, and as the Roman Empire uh, ebbed away through inner decay and weakness, then they were taken over by the barbaric tribes who integrated more so than uh, attacked and overcame and ruled over through, through conquest. They really integrated into the point where the Roman weakness melted into the barbaric takeover of a of a less a less civilized and a less uh in, intelligent and powerful form of government. This is what we see going on in America. Everyone's so freaked out thinking about an invasion and you know, we're gonna be invaded or nuked or it may not be the case, people. It may be the same type of devolution where it eventually melts into another form. I mean, it's already doing it. This republicanism has been ebbing away, ebbing away, ebbing away, almost to the point now where we're into total socialism. It's devolved into socialism. And eventually it will devolve into tyranny and perhaps anarchy. But it's not something that happens overnight. So, you know, so much, so many of us are so... Um, obsessed with this one event that we think is going to happen that's going to, you know, overnight change the whole landscape. That may not be the case. The landscape is changing without you realizing it. It's like when you're out in the ocean and you're going out and you're going out and it just seems all the same and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you you, you go to the bottom all of a sudden. Because the sand from underneath you ebbed away without you realizing it. You thought you were on level ground, and all of a sudden you're in deep waters, and, and the tide, the current, the undercurrent, is pulling you out into the, to the deep, and you didn't realize it. You know, frog in the kettle. We can use a lot of different illustrations for the same principle. And that is what has gone on, okay? So that's how then... The Middle Ages began, the decline of Rome. Then you had this forming of this loose union that eventually turned into, you had the splitting of the East from West. Religion played a big role in that. Okay, when Constantine started the second, the second Rome, in a sense, Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, Turkey, he, he divided the empire. That was the beginning. And eventually, it split off completely for religious reasons, ultimately. The East went one way, and the West went another way. And the West and these tribes formed into what we now understand to be Europe, Europa. And in the Middle Ages, this Europa, for instance, developed into a conglomeration of individual regions. 
They weren't nations. They were tribal peoples. Barbarian doesn't mean they were running around like, uh, you know, primeval prehistoric men, Neanderthals. That's that's the, the thought we have in our mind when we think about the barbarian sacked Rome. No, it wasn't like that. These were agrarian people. Okay, these were farmers, people who lived off the land. They lived off the land. That's all really... Barbarian just means something we didn't understand. Someone who was foreign, someone who was from somewhere else, who was not part of the initial Roman Empire, was called the barbarian. It just means someone who was foreign to us, different, that we didn't understand. But that doesn't mean they were more primitive. Totally. They were of a different culture. And these were tribes. You had the Gauls, and you had the Moors, and you had the, all these different, you know, the Germanic tribes, which eventually broke up into, later on, later in, in, in after the Middle Ages, which came into the modern era, they became nation states, like Germany, France, and even the Scandinavian countries, okay? Denmark, uh, Nor Norway, the Netherlands, on and on and on. These became nation states, okay? England, the British Empire, became nation states too. The nation state of England, Ireland, Scotland. These were originally tribes. And at one time they were under the empire and then they split off and became nation states. And this was an era of the nation state. The era of the nation state was accompanied, supplied, enforced, and strengthened by industrialization. When the lifestyle, the agrarian lifestyle, in other words, the agricultural way of making a living farming, living off the land, gave way because of technology that was brought in. We would look at it today as primitive technology in comparison to the technology we deal with. But this era of time was called the Industrial Revolution, mainly starting in the end of the 18th century through the 19th century, and in all honesty, up to the middle of the 20th century, all the Industrial Revolution where machines were invented to do tasks that man could only do up to that point with his hands, with the help of horses and other animals, oxen, so, so on and so forth, that were used for building, for farming, for settling of the land. But when the Industrial Revolution came, when the steam engine was created, the printing press was created, you know, locomotives, the trains, you know, eventually automobiles, and of course, ultimately, airplanes and rockets and so on and so forth, okay, later on. But this Industrial Revolution created what was called were called urban centers. We call them cities today. But these were initially centers which housed factories, that manufactured goods, modern goods, for sale to the populace. So the people began to, began to migrate from the agricultural land, the farms, the country, so to speak, we would call it the country, into the cities to work in these factories which now gave way from the monarchs. Up to this time, you had what was called feudalism, okay? That meant that monarchs, kings, and the church through the high Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church in particular, and later on the Protestant churches, and the monarchs, the kings and queens, they owned all this land, and the people worked the land, they kind of leased, we would call it leasing, leased the land from the state and made their living off it. That was agrarianism. That was the agrarian culture. That was agriculture. It was farming. That's how they made their living. But when this technology set in, it drew these same people into the cities 
to work as slaves, really, underneath these capitalists, these merchants who own these factories, who manufacture these goods. And this is how society developed through the Industrial Revolution. You understand? So this is what empowered now these merchants began to become so empowered, and especially through the freedom that the Reformation and Protestantism brought, the rejecting of the state church, the rejecting of the monarchs, the kings and queens that were backed up by the state church, the Roman Catholic system, Protestantism gave that thing a death blow. Gave that thing a death blow and brought more freedom to the individual, and the, the, these began to become enriched and empowered, and they started to seek the power of governing. And they staged revolutions, and they came up with their own systems and documents and so on and so forth, just like the Westphalia Agreement over there, the 30-year uh, war, all that business that happened in Europe that formed nations like Germany. They became then, we entered then into the era of the nation state. And that era of the nation state has continued on into even this 21st century, but it is quickly ebbing away because there have been engineers, okay, societal engineers that we speak about a lot on this program who have been working to form a one-world government system that will take away this individuality of the nation state, this distinction of the nation state, and bring the world again into captivity underneath the control of a worldwide oligarchy. Okay? In other words, a hierarchy of leaders at the top running the whole world system as one entity. That's what we see in the last days presented in Scripture. We don't see the era of the nation state presented in Revelation, nor do we see it in the vision given to Nebuchadnezzar, the two visions given, uh, one to Nebuchadnezzar and one to Daniel, about the Gentile nations at the end of time. It is not nation states. It's not hundreds and hundreds of nation states presented. No, it is a world divided up into ten regions, ten kings, who have no power as of yet, but they are granted their authority one hour with the beast. When the feast of Revelation 13, most of us refer to that as the Antichrist, is given power, then these ten are given their kingdom and authority for a short time to reign with the beast. And the whole world, listen to this, wonders after the beast and worships the beast and his image and the dragon who gave him his power and his authority. So it's a one-world system. This is this new world order we're talking about. So I want to speak to those of you who are preaching that on one side, but you're not grasping the import of it on the other side. You're understanding that the scripture says in the very last days there will be a new, uh, a new world order, a one world tyrannical beast system ruled over by Satan through the beast and the false prophet and will be divided with governors, so to speak, like Rome had, governors of regions, ten kings, a conglomeration of ten kings 
over ten regions of the world who give their will and their authority and have one common policy with the beast. So it's not the nation states. The nation states will erode, whether they literally go away and don't exist anymore, or whether they're there in name but not really in practical everyday structure like we already see and have seen for the last quarter of a century in the United States of Europe. Yes, you still have Germany, you have France, you have Spain, you have, but you can drive across these borders without even having to present identification. It's really one country. It's one region, even though they still on the surface retain the name of their nation state. We this is France, we are the French. This is Germany, we are the Germans. This is Italy, we are the Italians. But really, in, practic in practical application, it's one region. Because you can pass over those borders without any checkpoint. So it's one land. So this is what we see already taking form in our postmodern world, in our contemporary world. And this is what's going on now in North America. And North Americans, particularly United States citizens, are freaking out about this because this is a foreign concept to them. It's a foreign concept to them because they don't study history and they don't really study geopolitics outside of how it directly relates to them. If Israel gets bombed or something happens in Iraq, then a lot of Americans know something about that. But they don't understand, for instance, the dynamics the workings of the United States of Europe that's been operating for almost 30 years in the very dynamic that I'm speaking of, which is now being implemented in North America. They've been talking about taking away these boundaries, the ones you're freaking about. You're freaking out. They're taking down the borders. They've been talking about this for two decades, that they're going to merge Mexico and Canada eventually with the United States of America and make it the North American region. And then there will be the South American region. And there will be the African region. And this, and the Euro, you know, Western European region. And the Eastern European region. And this and that and the other. So this is something that has been planned for a long time. It's not a surprise. The reason it's a surprise to Americans is because they're uneducated. They don't give a blank about the rest of the world, so they don't know anything about it, and they don't understand what the plan is and, and the agenda. The agenda is not just about America. Okay, you arrogant Americans, you tunnel vision, truncated, truncated Americans. It's not just about America. America might be the center of your world, but it's not the center of the rest of the world's world. There are other parts of the world, okay, and it's a worldwide phenomenon. And we need to understand this. So, we are coming out of the era or epoch of the nation state. And we are coming now into the infancy stages of this final ten-toe mixture uh, worldwide beast kingdom. That is what's going on. Let's look at scripture for here for a little bit. Okay, I'm going to read to you, first of all, from Daniel chapter 2, verses 41 through 45 in the Amplified. Daniel chapter 2, verses 41 through 45. 
And it says this, and as you saw the feet and toes, well, no, wait, wait, let me start in verse 40, forgive me. And the fourth kingdom, Rome, shall be strong as iron, since iron breaks to pieces and subdues all things. And like iron which crushes, it shall break and crush all these. Okay, that was the original Rome. And we have historical documentation. There's no need for interpretation, for a prophetic word. We have all the historical documentation to confirm that that's what the empire under Rome was like. That was the ancient Roman Empire. Okay, but now we move on in verse 41 to something interesting. And as you saw the feet and toes, now we're talking about another kingdom, but notice it is, it's indirectly connected by the substance that's found in both. Rome was of iron, right? Well, here we have another type of kingdom, but it's not mentioned as a different kingdom. No name is given to it, which also alludes to the fact that this may be the remnants of this initial iron kingdom, but a weakened form of it. Verse 41, And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of baked clay of the potter, and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But there shall be in it some of the firmness and strength of iron. In other words, some of the traits features and strengths of the initial Roman Empire that was so strong and brutal and powerful. Just as you saw the iron mixed with miry earthen clay. Verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of baked clay of the potter, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle and broken. And as you saw the iron mixed with miry and earth and clay, so shall they mingle themselves in the seed of men in marriage bonds, but they will not hold together. For two such elements or ideologies can never harmonize, even as iron does not mingle itself with clay. See, when it talks about those ideologies there not being able to harmonize or the different elements, that's where we see these different forms of, of systems, ideologies. The 20th century was the century of the ideology. What ideologies did we have? Well, we had communist Marxism. We had socialism. We had republicanism. We had democracy. We had Islam, we had Confucianism, which eventually took on communism, but now has reverted back to its, its initial state of Confucianism and added elements of um, republicanism or free enterprise to it. It's kind of a hybrid. We had fascism, we had Nazism, National Socialism, right? Nazism and some other smaller ideologies. It was the century of ideologies. So, what this is saying is that in the very last expression of this initial kingdom, because these systems all ultimately came out from Europe, which came out from the seat of the Roman Empire. So these are all weaker... The, uh, devolved expressions of this initial kingdom of iron. Now it's a kingdom of iron mixed with clay because these ideologies cannot harmonize. These elements cannot ultimately mix together. These differences play a role in causing them not to be able to be completely united. Verse 44, And in the days of these final ten kings, Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people, but it shall break and crush and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. 
verse 45, just as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Those, that describes all the former Gentile kings all the, the, the kingdoms of the Gentiles, going all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar and up to the very time of this final beast system. And the stone cut out without hands, of course, is Christ. And he comes and he crushes all those former systems. The great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain and the interpretation of it is sure. Daniel two forty one through 45. Now let's look at Revelation. Chapter 17, 12 through 14. And we see the same thing presented, okay? Verse 12 of Revelation 17. Also the ten horns, there's your ten regions again, your ten kings again, that you observed, here's the explanation, are ten rulers or kings. See, people, the Bible explains itself. We don't have to come in with all these extra interpretations. It, it interprets itself. Also the ten horns that you observed are ten rulers or kings who have as yet received no royal dominion. But together they are to receive power and authority as rulers for a single hour along with the beast. Now listen to this. Here's your new world war. These have one common policy. 13, these have one common policy. What does that tell you? Nation states traditionally have not had one common policy. Look at the radical differences between these ideologies which were encompassed initially or hosted initially by nation states. And they still are to, to some degree. Okay, communism was held at its base by the Soviet Union. It was then housed by their satellite states that they had under their control. That was one kingdom. China embraced communism, was a nation state. Okay, the United States of America embraced republicanism. It housed republicanism. Okay? The British Empire, England and so, democracy. Not republicanism, not as far off as republicanism, necessarily, more liberalism. Okay? What would be called liberalism. Back in the 1930s, they referred to as liberalism. Okay, free enterprise, some degree of checks and balances of law but, but law. but notice, even to this day, even though it's a figurehead thing and it's really more of an aesthetic and a, uh, an ornament on the surface, not really, okay, when it comes to money, the British Empire still has their monarchy. So it's a different form of government. And, of course, in Germany and France and the Central European states, they have what we would call socialism, a different form of government. Canada has socialism, not republicanism, socialism, and is based somewhat after the liberalism or democracy of the British Empire, and so on and so forth, okay? So, but notice in this final beast kingdom, this all gives way under the beast, whom you term all the time the Antichrist, okay? Under the beast, this all gives way to one common policy, opinion, or purpose. And they deliver their power and authority to the beast. So they surrender, they submit to the beast system. So we have a dictatorship, a worldwide dictatorship, lording it over ten regions ruled over by ten kings or governors of the beast. 
This is the final system that we see right before verse 14. They will wage war against the Lamb. So this we know is the very end. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ returning. And the Lamb will triumph over them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with him on his side are chosen and called, elected, and loyal and faithful followers. Revelation seventeen twelve through 14. So do you see that, people? Why am I bringing this up tonight? Because I'm trying to get you people that have such strong patriotic leanings toward nationalism, toward the, the fear. You have such a fear of the extinction of your national identity and your nation state, your American citizenship and identity. People, you can't believe these two things together. Either you believe that we're still in the era of the nation state and we're nowhere near the very end and the, the final beast system of the, of the end times before Christ comes, the system of the Antichrist, or you believe that we are in those end times. But if you believe that we are in those very end times, then you have to accept you have to accept that this nation state era is past. It will be extinct because this new one world system, this one common policy has to come into play. And it cannot come into play with the competition between nation states. So, if you understand that, as a born-again believer, and I've already dealt with you on the deeper spiritual level, of we're not of this world system, period. We are strangers, aliens, exiles, pilgrims, wanderers, sojourners in this earth. Our citizenship is in the invisible nation, Christ's kingdom, Christ's coming millennial reign. I've already dealt with you on that level, but I'm dealing with you tonight on a practical level of even believing in end times prophecy, that you must understand that the nation state era must come to a close in order for this one world beast system to come into power. And if that's the case, if we're in that era, then what a futile and futile enterprise what a waste of time energy intellectual powers resources study research all these things if invested into the survival of the nation state the united states of america for instance what a waste of time christian even if even if it wasn't wrong for the other reasons I gave you already, just on a practical, academic level, it's foolishness because here you have the academic proof from the Word of God that this is not the system that God has ordained, that God has ordained shall reign in the very last moment of time before Christ's return. This beast system must form, and Christians will have to live in this beast empire as sojourners, wanderers, aliens, exiles, pilgrims, strangers in the earth system. We have to change our mindset. And instead of continuing to fight on this front of the survival and, and the, the, uh, the hindrance to the extinction of the nation state, we need to be reprogrammed by the Holy Spirit, so to speak, re-indoctrinated. We have to have our minds renewed by the word of God, to prepare ourselves to live in the era of the 
final tyrannical world system of the beast. And if our heads are still back in the nation state, back in the United, the good old USA, born in the USA, born in the USA, I'm proud to be an American. People, wake up. Wake up. It's over. That boat sailed. We have to learn now how to live as true, sold-out believers in Christ in this revived Roman Empire of iron and clay. And in order for us to walk this walk victoriously, okay, to the glory of our Lord, to the glory of our Lord and for the extension of his kingdom, we have to let the Lord change our mentality. We cannot continue to have this mentality of nationalism, of patriotism, Okay, to a creature that's already died. It was a dinosaur on the backside of the desert of irrelevance for a long time. But now it is dead. And I'm crying out to my brothers and sisters in Christ, particularly in the United States of America, telling you, please, you're telling these other guys to wake up? You're telling the seeker-friendly guys to wake up? Yes, they do need to wake up on that side and not worship the beast, absolutely, and not take his mark and worship his image and follow his false prophet, absolutely. They need to wake up. But you need to wake up too. And don't think that Jesus is an American. Jesus is not an American anymore. I'm sorry, He, he... He turned in his citizenship, guys. And you know I'm being facetious. You gotta let the Holy Spirit wash this idea out of your brain because it's it's a fallacy. It's a lie. It's a deception. It's an error. And it will cause you to continue to walk in so many areas of error. We have to prepare now, and I speak to those who consider them Christ, themselves Christian leaders, five-fold ministry guys, okay? We have to get this first, and we have to teach the people. We have to finally do the function that Christ really put us here for which is not to minister patriotism, idealism, success, and and happy, yappy living to to the pew fillers, but to truly equip them for the work of the ministry of the last days. Equip them for the work of the last days harvest bringing these souls into the invisible nation, into the true kingdom of Christ, builder and maker is God, that's not made with men's hands. These things that Bambi quoted from that article. It's not about churches, buildings, attendance, tithes and offerings, mortgages, you know, lands, programs, staffs, all this worldly nonsense that the church was never supposed to be involved in to begin with. We have to start equipping the saints for the real work of the real ministry for the real last day's harvest. And we have to, in order to do that, 
The first step is we got to let go of these old, antiquated, ungodly, idolatrous ideas. We can't hold on to these things anymore. Do you understand that, people? I wanted to get into some other things tonight about slavery, but we'll we'll leave that for Tuesday. And I just encourage you tonight to think about what I've told you. Think about what I've told you tonight. And start asking yourself, do I have any of this mentality? Am I holding on to these old ideas and thinking that God is in them? There are whole ministries out there, scores of ministries out here, based on that false idea that I've debunked tonight, based solely on that false idea. And this is my final word because I'm running out of time tonight. I want you to hear this. These ministries are coming down. These ministries are coming down if they do not change their focus. God tolerated it for a season. You know, like it says in the Old Testament, uh, that God winked at sin for a season, but when the New Covenant came in, it says in the New Testament, forgive me, that when the New Covenant came in, God did no longer wink at sin because he provided the sacrifice for it. Well, it's the same here. God winked at our ignorant presentations and expressions of the kingdom of God for a season because he knew we didn't know any better. But that time has passed now, people. And we have to learn the truth. We love to quote that scripture, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But we have to really learn what that means. I love you all from the deepest part of my heart. God bless you. May the Holy Spirit bless you. And we will see you or hear you on Tuesday night. God bless.